Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my lecture series on sustainability issues in energy. I hope you've been enjoying these lectures. If you have, please make sure to like the videos and go ahead and subscribe to that YouTube channel if you want to get updates whenever I post a new video. Okay, so today we are going to continue our unit on geothermal energy with the second lecture in that unit. And in this lecture, we are going to talk about shallow geothermal systems and heat pumps. And I know that there's a lot of big fans of heat pumps out there. We're going to get into the nitty gritty a little bit about how they work and thermodynamics. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Okay, so just to set the stage here, how does geothermal energy work? In the previous lecture, I explained to you why the Earth is hot. We have a convecting outer core and a convecting mantle that very efficiently transfer heat from the center of the Earth up to the base of the lithosphere, uh, where it then conducts out to the surface of the Earth. So in general, the deeper you drill into the Earth, the hotter it is going to be. So the principle of geothermal energy is that you drill down in to, into the you know into the crust or below the surface anyway, and you get access to some elevated temperatures down there. And then what you'll do is you'll pump some fluid down your well. It will heat up in the subsurface where you've got those higher temperatures, and then bring it back up to surface where you'll have heated fluid. I say hot. It doesn't necessarily have to be that hot, but it's hotter than when you put it in anyway. So then there are various things you can do with this hot fluid. Uh, if you're operating at relatively low temperatures, you can just put this through a heat pump. Uh, this is really good for um, you know, domestic scale uh, heating and cooling. Uh, if you're operating at higher temperatures, you can put it through a heat exchanger and actually directly extract that heat rather than having to go through a heat pump. So both of those are efficient for heating and cooling of houses, commercial buildings, that sort of thing. Um, if you're operating at much higher temperatures, either by drilling very deep, or maybe you're in a spot where you've got very high temperatures close to the surface of the earth, for example, Iceland, then you can actually generate electricity directly um, by, uh, by passing the, the fluid through a turbine, either directly as steam or using it to create steam that'll drive a turbine. Um, and so this can actually generate electricity very well. So what we're going to talk about today is the um, lower temperature end of things. So here's another diagram showing the different types of geothermal systems um, that you typically encounter. And going from left to right, we go from very deep systems uh, to very shallow systems. Um, enhanced geothermal systems, which we'll talk about in a few lectures, um, drill very deeply, you know, several kilometers below the surface to get to very hot rock. And these systems can generate a lot of power. We're talking megawatts. Um, you can drill to moderate depths, you know, typically, you know, maybe a couple of kilometers and um, get to, you know, elevated temperatures where there's active fluid flow that's good for heat exchange in the subsurface. And these will generate, you know, still megawatts of, of power, which is good. And then a little bit shallower, these deep geothermal probes, which, you know, might be, you know, several hundred meters to maybe a kilometer or so, um, which give you hundreds of kilowatts of power. And then we get to the shallow systems, which is what we'll talk about today. Shallow geothermal probes, a couple of hundred meters, uh, two well system, 10, 20 meters, and then these uh, ground heat collectors, which are really just right below the surface. Um, so thinking about how much power is consumed by a typical house, um, we can use some figures from the uh, EIA to, to look at this. So in the South Central US, so Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, which is where, where I live, um, for heating, uh, typical power consumption of, of a house is uh, 723 watts. And for air conditioning in the summer, uh, it's 458 watts. Now, this is just an aside, but you always notice this, that actually air conditioning, although we do tend to use a lot of electricity in the summer, in terms of power consumption, is actually more efficient than heating. And that has a lot to do, you know, number one, with the, the way that, that, we, that we run these things. You know, ACs are typically heat pumps, whereas a lot of people are still using gas-fired furnaces for heating. But also, you generally have a smaller 
temperature differential, okay? If it's 100 degrees outside and I want to cool my house to 75 degrees, this is in Fahrenheit, okay? That's a 25 degree temperature differential. If it is 40 degrees outside and I want to heat my house to 75 degrees, okay, that's a 35 degree temperature differential. So typically when you're running your heat, you're dealing with a higher temperature differential than you are when you're running the AC. So that's another reason for that. Okay, enough about that. So you add those two, yeah, you add those two together, um, and then the rest of your typical power consumption that's not related to HVAC, and you get a total power consumption of about 2.4 kilowatts for a typical house in the South Central U.S. Um, now in New England, um, heating. Uh, takes up a lot more power because it's cold. I grew up in New England. It's a heck of a lot colder than it is in Austin, Texas. And so uh, your total power consumption for a house in New England is um, about three and a quarter kilowatts. Okay. So we're looking at a couple of kilowatts for, you know, typical houses in the U.S. And when you look at the types of the amounts of power that these shallow systems can provide, you know, if, if designed correctly, you can easily satisfy all of the power needs for a typical household through some of these um, shallow systems, which are good for, for residential use. Um, when I say shallow systems, we're talking about less than 400 meters depth, just, just as, as an aside there. Okay, now um, one thing you have to know is that near the surface, obviously the temperature right below the surface is going to be affected by seasonal variations in air temperature. Okay, here's a figure from Stober and Bucher. This is a site in Finland. Um, so you can see the average air temperature going from, you know, February when it's at its minimum, it's about what, what is that? Two, one, sorry, one degree Celsius, um, up to August when it's about 15 degrees Celsius. So um, what this means is that there's going to be a variation in the thermal profile of the subsurface, depending on if you're in February, where you're going from very cold at the surface, to um, August when actually the surface can be warmer than the subsurface. This actually is a really nice phenomenon because it means that during the winter, the subsurface is warmer. And so you can use that heat to heat your house. And in the summer, the subsurface is actually cooler. And so you can use that as a heat sink, okay? Um, most of the applications uh, of these shallow geothermal systems um, have been um, applied in northern latitudes, like in Europe, for instance. And so they're mainly concerned with heating. But there is an opportunity in places like Texas that you could use this in the summer um, for cooling as well. So uh, even when the um, subsurface temperature is only, you know, let's say 10 degrees Celsius, and you want to heat your house to 20, 25 degrees Celsius, uh, you can still extract that heat using a heat pump and get the, get the heat that you want. So here are how some of these shallow geothermal systems work. Um, there's this horizontal heat collection system. It's going to be um, a series of coils that are buried you know, a meter or two below the surface. Um, and that's your heat exchanger. So you've got your heat pump here, you pump cool working fluid through your heat exchanger and it absorbs heat from the subsurface, comes back here through your heat pump and then you transfer that to your um, distribution system in your house, okay? Um, this is a really simple system. It does require a lot of space because you need to have all this room out in your backyard to be able to bury this, okay? This isn't gonna be really feasible in a kind of a dense urban area. But if you're out in the country, you know, it takes up as about as much space as a septic system. Does anyone have septic systems anymore? Um, anyway, you know, a couple of couple hundred square feet, okay. Um, the other option, if you're in a more, you know, densely populated area where you don't have room for a horizontal heat collection is that you can use what's called a borehole heat exchanger. So this is where you actually drill a hole into the ground and um, you have a couple of, of, of heat exchange loops that go down there that go through um, a heat pump here. So same principle, you pump cold fluid down and then circulate the warm fluid back up and it goes through your heat pump where you exchange that heat into the internal circulation system um, of your house. 
Now these borehole heat exchangers, they operate below the water table. So you've got you know, fluid in the rock or in the sediment soil, whatever you're drilling into, um, that you know, efficiently transfers the heat to your working fluid, okay? Um, a typical power consumption for this type of system is that you'll use um, you know, about 25% of the um, you know, total energy just for the, um, for the compressor and the, and the expansion um, equipment in your heat pump. Okay, I want to digress a little bit here um, to highlight something interesting that is going on right here uh, near Austin, Texas. So here's a map of Austin. Here is UT. That's where my office is, right, right about there. And uh, if you go east of town uh, near Manor, so there's Manor right there, um, there's a small uh, housing development here called Whisper Valley. And Whisper Valley is unique in that every house has a geothermal heat pump um, uh, that's uh, part of a network that's connected through the whole neighborhood. So at, at each house, they've got a, a double U-bend pipe loop drilled into the ground, and it's connected to a community-wide, what they call a geo-exchange network. So you are, you are you know, using some of that energy for your own house, but you're also distributing um, that energy throughout the whole neighborhood. Um, they've got a few centralized facilities where they extract some of the heat. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty cool idea. So here's some pictures of the actual installation of these things. So all the piping, it's PEX-A. So this is a cross-linked poly, uh, polyethylene. And um, each U-bend is up to 335 feet long. So that's how far they're drilling um, to get down to the right temperature rock that they need for this. So, you know, being located here in central Texas, this can be used both for heating and cooling. This is pretty cool. Um, this is a photograph of what one of the U-bends looks like at the end. So your fluid comes down here, you exchange the heat, and then it goes back out the top, okay? So this is a pretty cool system, um, and I think this is a really neat idea, and I hope that more of these developments, you know, there's a lot of building going on in the Austin area right now, and I think this is a really great opportunity to build some energy efficiency into our, into our housing here. Um, you know, I just want to point out that, you know, um, we could do better naming the streets in some of these developments. So here's Whisper Valley with street street names. You know, we've got Moonlit Path. Okay, that's fine. Summery Street, Glimmering Road. Um, as we get farther back into the community, we get Fetching Avenue, Sumptuous Drive, Dalliance Lane, C Comely Boulevard, Be Becoming Street. Any so I. Yeah, anyway, so uh, back to um, heat pumps. So uh, here's how uh, this works, okay? So in general, you are using what's called a working fluid to pump down your heat exchanger, uh, heat up in the subsurface, and then come back out to the surface, okay? So um, your working fluid transfers heat from the subsurface to the surface uh, if you're working, if you're doing this for heating and if for cooling, it transfers heat back to the subsurface, but it is the fluid that you use here for the heating and, and, and cooling. So there are certain properties of a working fluid that you want. Um, and I'm just looking here at simple applications. And so this is a, an application where you don't have a phase change, okay? Nothing is being vaporized or condensing or anything like that. So if you've just got a simple application where your fluid is staying in the same phase, what you want is for it to have a low dynamic viscosity. This means that it's easier to pump and you don't lose as much energy to friction. Um, it should have a relatively low density because lower density means it's easier to pump. It should have a high specific heat capacity which means that more heat can be stored per unit volume. And it should also have a high thermal conductivity because this means that it will have heat transferred to and from it quickly, okay? So let's look at a couple of example, um, simple working fluids that do not undergo phase change. Um, so this is a table from, from Stover and Booker. So we're looking at water and then various mixtures of antifreeze, ethylene or propylene glycol, ethanol, methanol, 
um, and then calcium chloride. So if you think about the properties we just talked about, um, water has the lowest viscosity out of these. 25% uh, ethanol solution has the highest heat capacity and the lowest density. Um, that's also true. Methanol also has the lowest density of them. And then water has the highest ther uh, thermal conductivity. They call it heat conductivity here, but that's thermal, thermal conductivity. So um, we can also highlight the second most optimal of these. And you can see that water actually performs pretty well as a working fluid. It's got the lowest viscosity, the highest thermal conductivity, and you know, relatively high heat capacity and a you know, kind of middle of the road density. So this is great. The only problem with water is that it freezes at around zero degrees Celsius. Now, you know, here in Texas, I wouldn't really worry about the ground freezing, um, at least, you know, here in my backyard, it, you know, even during our, our you know, winter storm in uh, 2021, the, the ground actually did not freeze. It got cold, but it didn't freeze solid. Um, but, you know, Having grown up in New Hampshire, I know that the ground there freezes. It, it freezes down to about six feet, or at least it did when I was a kid. Um, and going back to our example here from Finland, you can see that for sure in the winter, right at the surface, um, the soil temperature is below freezing. Okay, So if you're doing this in a cold area where the ground does freeze during the winter, you've got two options. You can add some antifreeze to your working fluid. Um, the problem with that, though, is that it's going to degrade some of your properties. So if you add, let's say, 25% um, ethylene glycol, your viscosity goes up, your heat capacity goes down, your density goes up, and your thermal conductivity goes down. So you will degrade the working fluid properties. But, you know, maybe this is okay if you're still able to operate the system in the winter. Uh, the other option is to bury all the piping below the frost line. Um, or you know, size the system in terms of uh, pipe diameter and flow rates and that sort of thing so that you can move your working fluid through the frozen zone quickly enough that it won't freeze, okay? So that's a good way to plan. So now this brings up an important point. So let's imagine it's the winter, and like I talked about this before, um, and you've got a shallow geothermal system where the working fluid is coming in around 12 degrees Celsius. Um, but you need that water that's circulating through your baseboard radiators or through your radiant floor heating to be somewhere between 35 and 55 degrees Celsius, okay? Um, you know, so that's obviously a lot hotter than your working fluid. So we need to do something, and that's where heat pumps come in. So we need to do work to the fluid to boost the temperature. So let's talk a little bit about heat pumps. So this is a very basic compressor heat pump. Okay, so the way this works is you've got your geothermal circuit here that is transferring heat from the subsurface up here. Okay, so what happens here is that the, um, the geothermal working fluid will transfer heat to the working fluid of the heat pump. So you've got two isolated systems here. You have one set of working fluid that is operating in your geothermal system. You've got another working fluid that is circulating through your heat pump, okay? So the um, geothermal working fluid comes in here and it heats up the heat pump working fluid enough to evaporate it, okay? And so you've got a vapor then that comes out here and goes through a compressor. So you, when you compress the vapor, you increase the temperature, and then your hot compressed working fluid will come through here to another heat exchanger where you exchange that heat to your circulation system in the house, okay? Um, the um, working fluid in the heat pump loses a little bit of heat um, and it uh, condenses and then it goes through an expansion valve where it is allowed to expand, which decompresses and cools it off again, okay? And then it goes back to the first heat exchanger and it starts the process over again. So if you've got the right properties of working fluids in here, you actually can take 12 degrees Celsius here and end up with 55 degrees Celsius over here, just through thermodynamics. So, the four processes that we just described are in the heat pump working fluid are evaporation, compression, 
condensation and expansion. Okay, so we're not talking about the simple working fluid. Now we're having a working fluid that goes through phase change. You have evaporation and condensation happening here. So evaporation, we can uh, consider that to be a phase change at a constant pressure and temperature. Then when we compress it, we're doing PV work. Okay, then condensation again, that's a phase change at a constant pressure and temperature. And expansion again is PV work. Okay, so um, we got phase change. Uh, work, phase change, work. And that's how a very simple compressor heat pump works. All right, now we can represent this process in what's called a temperature entropy diagram for our working fluid. So a temperature entropy diagram plots the specific entropy on the x-axis. So this is entropy per unit mass, okay? On the y-axis, we have temperature. And your temperature entropy diagram will be divided up into a series of regions. On the left, you'll have the liquid regions. So these will be the conditions where your fluid is going to be a liquid. All the way on the right, you'll have the vapor region. So this is where your fluid will be a vapor. In the middle, you'll have this region here where you will have uh, liquid and vapor coexisting at different compositions, OK, um, that you can, um, you know, that can, that can be defined. And then uh, at the top here, that's your critical point. And above that, you've got a supercritical fluid, which is basically, you know, we, we talked about this before with carbon dioxide, but it is, a, you know, a fluid that has gas-like and liquid-like properties. So what we can do, we can take our temperature entropy diagram. So remember, here's liquid, here's vapor, and this is liquid plus, plus vapor region. And we can draw these isobars on it. So isobars are lines of constant pressure. So everywhere along this line here, you will be at a constant pressure. And depending on where you fall within the temperature entropy diagram, you can be in a different, um, a different phase, OK? The other thing you can do is that within the liquid plus vapor region, there are lines of constant composition. So for instance, the one I drew here, it's 75% liquid and 25% vapor. Um, so you've also got lines of constant composition. This reminds me of when I was an undergrad taking geology courses of looking at um, uh, phase diagrams for um, you know, melts of, of, of igne igneous rocks, right? You've got the liquidus and the solidus. It's, it's kind of like that, except we're dealing with liquid and vapor here, but it kind of reminds me of, of that. Okay, so a very simple representation of the heat pump process on the temperature entropy diagram is what's called the Carnot cycle. So I'm going to take you through that real quick. OK, so step one here is going to be where the geothermal working fluid comes in here and exchanges heat with the heat pump working fluid and evaporates it. OK, so that's step one. So we'll start here at the initial condition where we've got some mixture of liquid and vapor in that first heat exchanger. And what happens is that this is evaporation, okay? So remember, this is constant pressure and constant temperature. So we'll move to the right at constant temperature along one of these isobars. All we're doing is increasing entropy, okay? And um, if our evaporation then is isentropic, then we will, um, well, okay, let, let me skip to the next step. So the next step is compression. Okay, so compression, if we assume that compression is isentropic, then we will increase the pressure and increase the temperature uh, at constant entropy. So that's gonna to correspond to a vertical line here in the, uh, in the pressure entropy diagram. All right, so we evaporated our uh, working fluid and then we've compressed it. And we've compressed it just to the um, right to the edge of the liquid plus vapor region. So we've got, you know, we've got a vapor, but we don't have a superheated vapor, okay? Now, the next thing that happens is that the fluid passes through the second heat exchanger where it exchanges heat with your, uh, your domestic circulation system. So again, this is a uh, condensation process at constant pressure and temperature. So we move straight to the left on an isobar and we end up somewhere over here. And then step four, as we go through the expansion valve, again, if we assume this is isentropic, 
we go along a vertical line back down to our initial condition. Okay, so that's a very simple uh, representation of this, and that's how the Carnot cycle works. Um, in reality, the compression and expansion are not isentropic processes. Okay, so these lines are actually not vertical in a real system. And actually, there's a different um, cycle, which is called the Rankine cycle, which more accurately describes how a real uh, heat pump operates. So the um, compression is not isentropic, which means it's not reversible. And that's because your compressor here doesn't operate at 100% efficiency. There's always some loss there. Um, and then same thing over here. This line here is not going to be isentropic because you always have losses when you're doing PV work, OK? So this is how the, uh, the ranking cycle, cycle operates. But the basic principle is essentially the same. Now, working fluids that are used in these type of compressor heat pumps, they have to obviously allow for a phase change. Um, and these can include vapor, ammonia, various organics, including alkanes, so, you know, pentane, octane, that sort of thing, methyl propane, methyl butane, and then hydrofluorocarbons, which are, you know, probably the most widely used. This is what's in your refrigerator and probably in your air conditioner, uh, for example. So um, here are some um, phase diagrams for both water and ammonia. And the things I want to point out here, water does not work really well for heat pumps that require a phase change. And the reason for that is that the, you know, the temperature is simply too high, OK? So if we look here, so if we're operating at one atmosphere, obviously the um, boiling point is uh, 100 degrees Celsius, uh, it's going to be really hard to exchange enough heat from the subsurface to get that to happen unless you're working with a very deep enhanced geothermal system. We'll talk about that later. But for shallow systems, water just does not work really well because the, um, the boiling temperature at the pressures that we like to work at uh, is, is, awfully, is awfully high. I guess you, know, you could work with some extremely low pressure, but then being able to maintain that type of low pressure in a heat pump is you know, probably, <laughs> probably more trouble than it's worth. Uh, here's ammonia over here. Ammonia works really well at one atmosphere, which is this, uh, this line here. Remember, one atmosphere is 101.325 kilopascals. Um, the, uh, let's see, this is the uh, liquid vapor transition line here. The boiling point is actually 240 degrees Kelvin. So that's what, 33 degrees below zero Celsius. So it's got a pretty low boiling point. Um, it, you know, it works decently well. Um, the problem with ammonia is that it's extremely toxic. Uh, we'll get into this a little more in our unit on hydrogen, but, um, it's a great working fluid, but it has a lot of environmental and kind of health and safety issues. So there's this class of chemicals um, called, uh, what are they called? Hydrofluorocarbons. Um, you know, if you are my age or older, you can remember when we were kids, uh, chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs were commonly used as refrigerants. And after we figured out how bad those things are for the ozone layer, uh, the Montreal Protocol totally banned them. And so we don't use CFCs anymore. We use um, hydrofluorocarbons, which are much more environmentally benign. So this is a phase diagram for one particular um, refrigerant. This is refrigerant R410A, which is a 50-50 mixture of difluoromethane and pentafluoroethane. Um, you can see that at one atmosphere right here, the boiling point is 224.5 Kelvin. So uh, that's similar to what we saw with ammonia. It's a little bit lower. But the nice thing about this is that it's much less toxic than ammonia. So, you know, this is a really good working fluid that you can use um, in these types of systems. Here's what the pressure and entropy diagrams look like for them. Um, the nice thing about these refrigerants, if you look at the temperatures that you're operating at, so remember for a Rankine cycle, you're going to be operating within the liquid vapor region and then just outside into the vapor region. So thinking about the temperatures that you operate at, um, 
you know, for this refrigerant, you can operate at, you know, much lower temperatures than, say, if you're dealing with water. So with water, if you're doing a Rankine cycle, you know, you're going to be operating in excess of 100 degrees Celsius. So, um, you know, it's not a really good working fluid for a shallow uh, geothermal system for that reason. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our lecture today on shallow geothermal systems and heat pumps. So next time we're gonna start our discussion of deep geothermal systems. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and stay tuned for the next one.